Coming up, we take a look at the NBA offseason landscape as more teams become buyers. How can that stand to potentially benefit Brooklyn, but also put them in a difficult spot in retaining one Nicholas Claxton? We dive in coming up next. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ah, uh, yes, my friends, it is the Locked On Nets podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. He's Doug Norrie. I'm Adam Arbeck. We thank you, as always, for making us your first listen of the day. We are 100% free on all those great platforms. And let you know, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code LOCKEDONNBA to get $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. And as we say, Doug... Terms apply to the NBA offseason and wanting to accomplish goals, whether it's for the Brooklyn Nets or otherwise, there's more than just one, as in our, agenda for this upcoming NBA offseason. Yeah, as the offseason starts to take shape here and like around how different teams are going to maybe view themselves going into next year, I think this has been a really interesting postseason, which shows you that the NBA landscape might be a little more wide open than we've seen in the past, right? Like sometimes it's hard to see that when we get whittled down to just a few teams, you know, like, well, how could anyone beat these teams? And it's like, well, that's what everyone thought about the Nuggets last year. And guess what? They're not in it anymore. So yeah, I think yeah. that as we get into a landscape that might be a little flatter than most people thought, we are going to probably see, and according to this recent reporting, which we'll get into, we're going to see more teams possibly being buyers this offseason than we thought there was going to be. And that creates possibly some problems for the Nets, but possibly some opportunities as well. Yeah, we're going to be uh, touching in on the Utah Jazz report and what their offseason looks like. Before we get, uh, let, let's start with that. But I do think it's interesting to ponder it later on in the episode about how the NBA playoffs informs the way teams look at their offseason. So, you, to, to your point about Denver Nuggets, well, they were the champions. They're going to go back again. Oops, they didn't. Does that start to tell teams, hey, maybe it actually is a little bit more open? And if we can get to a certain level, it's just about getting in the mix. It doesn't feel as. Uh, Golden State Warrior era fixed where you go, oh, oh. unless you load up and you can somehow break this team down. That version of a of a of a of a juggernaut team is not there right now, even with the way we perceive you know the Joker and the Nuggets coming into this year. Clearly, it's more open than people thought it was a year ago and will be going forward. The Pacers just made it to the Eastern Conference Finals and kind of hung with Boston with TJ McConnell and yeah. Andrew Nemhart. Right. Yeah. So it's it's like, I mean, what are we doing here? There's there's a there's possibilities are might be much might be even greater than we're even giving it credit for because some I mean I know like the 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 Eastern Conference was just a total hellscape of injuries but again but that happens. like that can happen every year too <laughs> yep. so you're like hey if we put our best foot forward every year maybe we can make a run and so when you hear this report about the Jazz coming from Mike Scotto who works for with Hoop Hype and one of the best out there really it's just sort of like aggregate not even aggregate reporting news and then just getting like a sort of like and he's been great with the Nets especially uh getting like sort of a holistic look at the league he comes out and posts or he actually reports the other day that the Jazz are expected uh to shop their first two round uh, their two first round picks this year 10 and 29 and they're possibly going to be looking for a win now type of player with uh, general ideas around wanting to maybe accelerate a timeline around Lori Markinen, right. right? Like having some other pieces in place, seeing Lori Markinen as possibly, you know, a star. And now they want to surround it with like, you know, guys who can actually win instead of what they've been doing the last couple of years since trading Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. So may, again, I'm not sure, like probably could have seen it coming a little bit, but sometimes these are the teams that creep up on you and say, Oh, they're trying now. They have a ton of assets. Can't you know you, you can at some point have too many draft picks probably as OKC will attest to, and at that at some point you're just like hey let's just try to win we have good players why don't we try to go for this so Utah entering the mix as a possible win now team just adds another name to the group of player of teams that are going after guys that everyone's going to be going after and that makes the market maybe like a little harder to flesh out. Yeah, it's interesting. So do you think that Utah is informed at all by these playoffs? I mean, I started to say it there at the top, but that or any of these teams. And now because with marketing in Utah, their thing was they set 
a Rudy Gobert type package level demand around anyone that was thinking about coming after marketing over the last trade deadline. But it was always speculated kind of, well, there's in, they're in this in-between spot. Yes, they have some talented players, but ultimately they're going to try to get even more draft capital and do a, a full reset, a full rebuild. Now, to your point, they look at it and go, well, how far off are we really? And it, and with this draft class coming up being perceived to be weak, you say, well, we have two first round picks in this class. Can we turn that into something that at least for our organization, we view on paper as not being worth it to take two players in their 20s, early 20s, develop them. We would love and prefer to actually bring in one or two players here and find ourselves being in the playoffs next season and just seeing what happens in the first round, seeing what happens if we can make it to the second round. Because as you and I have long stood on, it matters to just be a good team. Yes, everybody wants yeah. to win championships. Of course, that's the ultimate goal. But being a good team is a good thing. And if you're a small market team like Utah, you probably also get a good sample size of what it looks like to not be in that mix over this past season. Yeah, and, and when you hit on a guy like Markkinen, right? Like all of a sudden you do want to maybe win now. So there's a couple other things too that I want to say about this. One is, look, well, you're a buyer when you actually buy and you're a seller when you actually sell. And anyone right. can say anything about whatever they want to do. And right up until the point where you actually do it, no one really knows. So I, I do want to give that little asterisk around because they're also sort of in the same breath. We're like, hey, we wouldn't mind shopping John Collins, right? So, right. Um, so this is so this is part of it, and then we're going to get to like why it's important for the Nets here shortly. But one other thing around Utah is there could be a situation where it's like they want to resign because like marketing's extension eligible, right? Yeah. And you're like, hey, it's hard to it's hard to get free agents in here. Right. And so we kind of have to overpay a little bit on the guys we already have and sell a story to the guys we already have because no one is beating down Utah's doors to sign in free agency. Right. And so you can be a little forward facing in your messaging around something, especially where your star player is concerned for this to be a part of it. Right. So right. this is all to say talk is cheap and actions are the thing that actually pay the bills. And so who knows? But with Markin and being extension eligible, right? Like maybe they move on from Collins. You have Sexton, who I think showed a decent amount this year, right? Like you have Taylor Hendricks, you have Conte, Conte George, Kessler's gives you a rim protector, even though he kind of wasn't starting near the end of the year. Like they have some pieces here that it would make sense for them to say, maybe we can pacers this thing, yeah. right? And and maybe make a trade. Anyway, long story short, I I think that it does make sense to at least talk like this. And we'll know when they actually do it. <laughs> and that's like right. my well, only little caveat to that. And, and it's for every team in this position. It's yes. right. Like I said, put yourself in a position where we're going to improve. We want to compete. And if, if it doesn't work out, then yeah, we're going to have our option too. If we can't get players in around marketing, then okay, we can think about things differently as we move into the season. But right now, and you mentioned, by the way, that's two young players that are having success for that team as well. Being able to draft because you got a hall of picks. All of a sudden, your organization can be informed by the fact that, hey, look, with some first round draft capital, we ended up turning it into some players that could be real contributors for us. And now we try to change our timeline here. How, Doug, does all this impact the Brooklyn Nets, though? I mean, listen, we can have conversations about players that the Utah Jazz might want from the Brooklyn Nets, but also being on a marketplace where veterans like Dorian Finney Smith, maybe like a Dennis Schroeder, could potentially be viable for the Jazz or any competitive team. We'll talk about that coming up next. All right, first, hey, better friends, over at game time. Look, you're excited for the NBA Finals. I mean, I how am. awesome would it be to go to actually go to an NBA Finals game? Game time makes getting NBA Finals tickets even faster, even easier. Prices on game time app actually go down to the closer it gets to tip off. That's really not something you're going to see in these markets a lot. They got killer last minute deals. They got all in prices, views from your seats, lowest price guaranteed. And look, game time takes the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets, takes the guesswork out of buying all tickets, too. I mean, my kid the other day was mentioning a concert that she wanted to go to. I was like, we got to head on over to game time. Uh, like, this is where we're going to really know if we're going to get the best deal. And I don't hate to break it to you. Game time actually had the best deals for the <laughs> concert of the unnamed artist that I will say it won't say here. This is where the game time app helps you out. Going to give you the best prices. Going to let you see exactly what you're going to see when you sit down in your seat. Save up the 60% buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, etc. Um, save even more when you choose a section and let Game Time choose the seats for you. It's all there on for the app. You're going to take the guesswork out of it. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Create an account, redeem the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. 
All right, so as we continue today's Locked on Nets episode, I mentioned Dorian Finney-Smith at the end of the first segment there. Reminder, we just did a great episode. I mean, one of the best, but they're all they're all the best. They're all our little babies. All time. On Dorian Finney-Smith <laughs> and, and what it looks like for potentially being able to get value out of him as the Brooklyn Nets look like they want to try to move him ahead of the 2024 draft, maybe for getting back into those draft waters. But I'll pivot here. I'll pivot here quickly. Because let's go, let's let's trend negative, and then we'll bring it back around positive at the end of the episode. If we're talking about not even Utah, but just a more competitive market this offseason in a free agent class that is perceived to be weak, in a draft class that is perceived to be weak, right? 2025 is not only the big year for a deep draft class, it's also about when so many big names are actually going to be free agents and able to be sought after simply for the dollars rather than trade assets. This is where we come back to the Nicholas Claxton piece. And listen, he's been talked about glowingly by the organization, by the new head coach. They want defensive accolades poured all over him. But remember, he's a free agent. So if all these competitive teams start to look at the landscape of free agency, you start to add that short list up. Nicholas Claxton is going to be close to the top of that from not only a skill set, but also an age standpoint. And I just wonder... That 20 to $25 million, oh, it seems so insane. It might not look so insane if there's just not a lot of options out there and a team believes that he can be a needle mover. We've mentioned other ones before, like Oklahoma City maybe being chief among them. Yeah, I mean, that was reported the other day, too, that OKC is going to look to probably add, try to add a center here in free agency. Clax's name was mentioned. Isaiah Hartenstein's name was mentioned as the two you know, biggest guys to go get. We've talked about this before, that we thought that Claxton's skill set would line up pretty well in OKC next to Chet. We've seen what happens when you get you know, a, a rim protector plus like a big floor spacer uh, into the mix. I mean, the, yeah. the, the Wolves are running this right now with Gobert and Towns, and they're in the Western Conference Finals. So, um you know, say what you want about those guys, but like they're there. So <laughs> like, and that's kind of the whole story. And OKC, who desperately lacked rim protections, especially near the end of the year, yeah. I mean, really could stand to add a guy like this, especially even just like to take those minutes when Chet's not on the court. So that market's going to be there. OKC has cap space. Like that's a dangerous team to kind of enter the mix and possibly overpay here. Now they get to pay their other guys sooner than later too. So like yeah. there's some other concerns, but where these markets could ha be end up looking really iffy for the Nets. Like then I Clax is not a threat to go to to is not a threat to be traded to Utah. But I guess more of the point is as we continue to make lists of teams that think they need something, yes, like that begins to look more like the thing. And see, and, and, and it's a double problem bottom line for the Nets too, because the more the other teams feel like they need stuff the harder it is going to for the Nets to get the things they need at relatively decent prices because the Nets need all the help they can get on that front. Like they can't afford to overpay a secondary star or third rate, a third, you know, a top 75 player. Yeah. Because they don't have a top 25 player teams that have the top 25 players relatively cheap can go and do that. Yeah. But yeah. teams that like the Nets that don't have that can't overpay at this point. And so I think the whole landscapes gets harder for them to just make the team that's like competitive and good. If all the other teams are going to want these relatively scarce pieces. Yeah. Cause if we talk about it from a high level, like we have with the nets and I I've said, listen, even if the price is a little bit steeper than maybe you think it should be for Nicholas Claxton, you sign him to a four year deal, you turn around two years from now and you can make different choices. But when you start to, you know, encapsulate the entire the entire outlook we see we keep saying get to 2025 right but by the way another great episode go back and listen to doug and i as i laid out a really strong path forward for brooklyn where they don't trade also tied for first that yeah, was the other one another first. one that's tied you, for first <laughs> you wouldn't believe the number of episodes tied for first place but that's what we do here we do quality programming well yeah and we do it all the time now but but if you go like to look at that perspective on it and say okay there is this path they're going to have a lot of money in 2025 now, 20 to 25 million on Nicholas Claxton would still put them in a spot when Ben Simmons money comes off the books. If Dorian Finney Smith gets traded, if Dennis Schroeder comes off the books, you're still you're still going to have money. But then you have Cam Thomas coming up and are you going to give him a contract extension? It's not that it would prohibit any significant move the Nets wanted to make. But it would still be money on the books that you could spend in a different way. So this is where I think what becomes interesting to me is. If you're the Nets, we're always trying to sell what their agenda looks like or what their goals are here. If you're the Brooklyn Nets and you're talking about wanting to get back into the 2024 draft, 
wanting to refill these coffers a little bit, maybe still keeping McHale and Cam Johnson. I just wonder if we can look at the free agent class now. And to your point, can the Nets thread the needle of maybe some team offers Nicholas Claxton a bigger contract than they're willing? Let's say it's OKC. Is there still spots for the Nets to do some margin spending this free agent class to quote unquote, right? Field the competitive roster going into the season or are, because it just seems impossible for the Nets to walk into the upcoming year going, it's going to be Noah Clowney and Dayron Sharp. Let's get it. Like it just, even if you, even if you are about the rebuild, that's a really hard sell, I think for the fan base, even if we understand it's a bit of window dressing. And that's where I think this is that hard spot as teams may start pursuing Claxton a little bit you get back in this corner of 25 million a year for Claxton. It's not, that doesn't kill us, but it certainly doesn't help us. If we think about two and three years down the road, potentially. Yeah. They're in a really tough spot here. I, like they, they, they're in a spot where it's going to be hard to walk into next season and not can be, be competitive after a really, really disappointing year this year. And they have a potential to have like lots open for the season after, but then you run the risk of being bad this year. And no one really wants to come. Right. Yeah. So I, like they are, this is a very, very tricky spot for this team. I, like I don't exactly know the exact path of correct path forward here. I'm very um, sympathetic to the idea of you still have to put butts in seats. And yes. if you stink with no hope that gets harder. Like, I, so I, I, we definitely get that part of it. This is why I'm like, Hey, look, if for the right price, if you added Donovan Mitchell, and another piece, like, would we sign up for it? Of course, of course, it's much better to do a podcast and watch the nets when they're actually good. Uh, like, believe us, <laughs> right? Like you got to believe us. On Trust this me. We've, te we've tested the waters. We've on tried both. Times. We've tried both. We've tried and both. the, and the, the much better version is when they're good. Uh, like, so uh, like, it's not that it's just that when we look at this, it, it's like, you know, for what? Look, and, you know, and there's a fan base around there that's like, look, win tomorrow. I don't care what happens in 10 years. I, I get that part of it. I, I'm with you. You know, you know, 10, 10 years, five years, a long time from now. Like I building sure. towards something is harder. The, the, you know, lizard brain part of me wants to be like, just get the guys and win now because that's more fun. Right. And then the other version of it for me is that you look at this landscape and you're like, hey, everyone's kind of got a much better one a already right now, or like more than half the league has a better one a on the team. It's going to cost the nets to get that guy. Yeah. That's going to be tough. There's a version where like they are in a good spot to kind of retool around a lot of assets and really like line themselves up good for 27, 28. That's all. It's harder. I, I I'm anyway, law again, it's like, I don't know. I don't think there's, I, I for sure do not think there's a perfect answer that I'm that no, I'm convinced of. No. There's not a perfect answer. I think there's one path that seems like it has slightly more potential, but it's more painful in the short term. And that's a, that, and I'm sure Sean Marks and company are feeling like sort of like this exact same push and pull around what to do, because it's not just about, Hey, We'll tell our grandkids about how great these picks are going to be, right? <laughs> like, I, like I just it, gather it's, around. It's a tough sell. <laughs> well, and, and by the way, as always, as the reminder, this is not a this is not a knock on Nicholas Claxton. Like, I I I think I maybe even more than Doug at times, but Doug has been on the same. Of like, he's a good player. He's a good yeah. player. The, the the problem that you've run into here with with Nicholas Claxton for the Brooklyn Nets specifically is his development. When you had superstars, it was like, oh, baby, watch this guy come along here. Young player, going to be running the court, going to be doing the defensive things. Kevin Durant's there, Kyrie Irving, James Harden. As those superstars go away, it's not even about Nick – Nicholas Claxton hasn't gotten worse. It's no. just that the team has gotten worse around him. And He's good. Team. He's really good. It's a testament to him. Yep. You should go out and get as much money as possible. Yes. Like, it's life-changing generational money. You should go and get as much as possible. Yeah. He deserves it. He's yes. he's really improved. And it's it, just – it's just a dollar. It's like it, it, everyone's spreadsheet's got to look the correct way at the end. Like, <laughs> and, that, and that's why coming up here in a second, this is not all doom and gloom because in a down free agent class, in a down draft class, how can the Brooklyn Nets stand to benefit from more teams getting into the waters? It's by having a couple of key veterans that could be sought after. We'll talk about Dorian Finney-Smith. We'll talk about Dennis Schroeder and a way that Brooklyn gets back in the 2024 draft coming up here in just one moment. All right, so as we continue on with the Locked On Nets podcast, we remind you, you get us over on X, at Doug Norrie, at Adam Armbrecht, at Locked On Nets, on YouTube, and all those great places to get your podcast. Why? Because that's what we're doing. Again, hundreds of shows, guys, hundreds of shows over the last couple of years, 
all tied for first for the best show. And that's really what we're about here. It's a standard of excellence. Sorry. That's just the way it is. Yeah. I, and by the way, that's a thoughtful ranking too. Like it's just, we, <laughs> we took our time with those. That. We took They're our time. time. We one. I can't say I, one. Sorry. There might've been one that's like a uh, fraction. It's not even worth, it's not even worth getting into it. Cause it's basically all rounds to one. Yeah. 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 It was like 99.9%. And that's what, what am I going to do with that at that point? Correct. When we talk about this off season, Utah Jazz, all these teams, OKC. You know what's funny too? I think about how you mentioned OKC. It was when it comes to the Nets having a couple of these veterans that could be sought after. So the nice part here is having these te- these guys under contract. Dorian Finney-Smith, maybe Dennis Schroeder. You think about him more as an in season and at the trade deadline potentially. Another guy that when he came over, we thought, all right, you know, you end up with Dennis Schroeder. And then this was both a compliment and a curse. It was, man, Dennis Schroeder really looks, you know, like a like a solid NBA veteran player. And then you also thought, damn, we don't have anybody in this backcourt, do we? Because it was yeah. such a contrast to have a guy who just plays NBA basketball consistently over a decade come in and show you that sample size. But if teams are going to be more competitive, whether or not you think it's a weak draft class, Dorian Finney-Smith, like there could be a smallish bidding war for him if the idea is, hey, it's just a 2024 first round pick. We don't think it's that valuable. Brooklyn Nets, without having that pick, go, we do. How high can we get it? We mentioned on that episode, all the way into the top 10 when Memphis is living there, somewhere in the top 15. Guess what? That's valuable for the Brooklyn Nets in a way that it is not valuable for competitive teams. So just point stop on Dorian Finney-Smith. I think we're going to see Sean Marks maybe claw back a little bit of that diminished value for Dorian Finney-Smith that he was setting the bar. We demand a first-round pick. People will say, well, it's not a 2025 first round pick. We know it's not. But if he can get back into the mid rounds of this draft class, that would still be an accomplishment, albeit for someone who maybe waited too long to do it in the first place. Yeah. And by the way, like a lot of these teams, too, that might be sellers or mini sellers here, it's not like they have these like big dynamic. Well, not, I guess he's not super dynamic, but like these big veteran wings to give away. Like these guys just actually don't really exist too much on the bad teams, right, right? Right. And most teams that have guys like this, especially at his contract, which is still relatively good, aren't selling that guy because they kind of still need them. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so it is a little bit rare that the Nets have this guy right now that might be a bit redundant, probably doesn't line up exactly with their timeline and that they are able to shop him. And it's because you just look on the teams. A lot of these teams that have been at this for a while that are bad, that might be willing to trade veterans, don't really have the veterans to trade. And we saw some of them move last year, like the Pistons traded bogey. You know, like these guys kind of were a little bit on the move already. Hayward, you know, right? Like Charlotte ditched right, right. Hayward uh, over to OKC. And so those guys already got moved a little bit. Mm-hmm. And those aren't like 100% comps for DFS. But my point is, guys that are getting a little old, they're not, not on the other team's timeline. Time to kind of move on. I don't know. There's just go through the rosters. There's just not many of these guys because most times they just kind of they they kind of get traded around the contenders. Nets thought they were one. They're not. And now they have DFS to kind of probably trade. Well, by the way, and they traded Royce O'Neal, right? Like, I mean, it's like the yeah, it's another know, good you, example. They yes, have it in their back pocket here, right? Overpaid for him, but but then also moved off of him. And by the and way, by the way, played in the playoffs. Like he played yeah. in the playoffs. Like he did exactly. I mean, the, the Suns flamed out, but he did kind of what he was supposed to do. Could play high leverage playoff minutes in a pinch. And you know what's funny too is that I actually think one of the benefits for Brooklyn or any team that has veterans like this that isn't on a, a you know win now timeline, I think that the NBA, I think that a lot of of high level competitive teams fall under the misconception of. So like Dallas would be the good example, even though Derek Lively ends up getting injured. We talked about him, a rookie comes in, plays real minutes, and becomes a contributor on a deep playoff run team. Awesome, but most teams say. We want the veterans. We want to bank on experience. We want to bank on on what we know. And I actually think that 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 stands to benefit the Nets or any team that has veterans, that NBA teams want the perceived floor of what a player is. So we'll take a 30-year-old, a 31-year-old guy, because we know what we're getting in him. The reality probably is a lot of times the younger players, if you get the right guys in the right positions, right, filling the right role, they have the upside, though, so they actually can move yeah. the needle for your team in a way that that veterans can't. Veterans will always give you your expectation, but then a lot of times when you get to playoffs, what do we end up saying? Yeah, well, what do you expect? I mean, you're not asking Royce O'Neal to take over a game when Phoenix is floundering and going down 0-2 or 0-3 in a series. 
You expect him to come in and serve his role because the stars are going to do their job. So I actually think that that's an interesting part about this too. And it's what keeps Dorian Finney-Smith's value still relatively high because teams yeah, look around. And, or, go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry. I, go, teams look, finish your thing and then I'll say one thing. Sorry, yeah, because teams look around and they go, oh, I know that Dorian Finney-Smith did X when he was playing behind Luka in Dallas. We have our star. We bring him in here and he does exactly that. But the 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 separation between him and a maybe second or third year player or even rookies is not as far apart as the NBA, I think, creates the perception of, which is how veterans stick around and how veterans get paid in, the, in these off seasons. And every year we see examples of guys who just were given a little slightly longer leash, who maybe stock pedigree wasn't that high. And yep, now all yep. of a sudden they are much, much better because they were given time. And like what's it's sometimes it's just because the veterans can get out of the way, right? We saw this with Clowney at the end of the year. It's like veterans out of the way because the team is sure. in the tank. Now all of a sudden I can show. I mean, the perfect example of this, honestly, and I'm so annoyed at myself because I was going to tweet this out the other day. And then you don't I get was credit like, now, though. Yeah. I, I'm, what, what's that? You don't get, you won't get, credit I don't get, now, I don't get credit. And, but it annoyed the ever, I mean, it really annoyed me for like days that I was going to be like, Andrew Nemhart to me seemed like this perfect candidate of a guy. that's like, got a lot, lot of, you know, was allowed to play a lot, started as sort of a defensive guy, showed some flashes of offense mm -hmm. and all of a sudden then was given like more opportunity and then really shown. Right. Yeah. And then I was, I was like, ah, I didn't send it. And then he just absolutely goes nuts in the, in game three for 32 points. I was like, what am I gonna do? Send it now. Like, oh, right. <laughs> right? So hey, everybody <laughs> should know. I, well, I was thinking about it. Well, I was, I was, I swear I thought this, I you can check my brain. But, <laughs> but my point is that if you sometimes are just allowed to just make mistakes, play a little more, have the path in front of you, be a little less, you know, uh, uh, or be a little less, be a little more unobstructed, then you can turn into something good. The Nets, if they have these log jams, getting these guys in the draft around this time and being and saying, hey, we don't need these win now pieces. There's a reason the, guy, the stars like to play with veterans. I get it. These other teams don't have the same level of patience. LeBron doesn't want to draft someone and develop them. Like it, that's yeah. not that's not what I'm not what I'm here to do, you know. <laughs> so um, unless, unless Nets, it's my son, then I'll I'll take a look at. Well, it. That, that's that's different. But as as we would all no no shame in that. But no. like, so, but Nemhart's this example. It's like start as one thing and become something else if you're given enough time to do it. And then that's in a position I think to be able to if they were getting to this draft or get like get go this way, right? Like to yeah. go this way, like just a little more time. We can make something at a at a at a low value, and I don't know. So anyway, there's just lots and lots of examples. There's examples where it doesn't work, but there's just lots of examples where it do if, if you have this right amount of the requisite amount of patience. And that's why we're going to have an episode coming up looking at the free agency landscape. If Claxton were to leave via free agency, here's some names, some guys that could be on the come up that maybe the Nets get some buy low value and get pleasantly surprised over the next couple of seasons. So again, 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 stick around for what are all a plus. 100% fresh episodes from Lockdown. Look, I'm an objective grader. They're all A yeah. pluses. I, like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> like, they're all just 100%. Sorry. We don't we don't grade um, on the curve here. We're very strict. Well, we well, we do grade on the curve, but the problem is they're all A's. So yeah, then the no curve, curve just becomes... <laughs> that curve is flat. <laughs> when, when everything's the best, you flatten the curve. Anyway, long story <laughs> short, we're going to get out of here. We right. And as we've said many times, and I'm going to keep saying this, Nets did not hold up their end of the bargain this year. They yes. did not make the playoffs. That doesn't matter for us. We're going to roll all the way through the playoffs. Nets didn't hold up to their end of the bargain, get into the draft yet. We're going to be all here all through the draft in the offseason, five days a week. Locked on Nets. Subscribe to YouTube. Subscribe over where you're listening to podcasts. And you, the fans, you held up your end of the bargain coming and supporting us as we always appreciate it. Count your age by friends, not years. Count your life by smiles, not tears. Why, Douglas, that was one Jonathan Lennon. Oh, R.I.P. One of the all-time great poets. I, Johnny, Johnny Lennon. will be one of the all-time great poets. Obviously, R.I.P. We'll be back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball. Basketball, basketball.